So today I'd like to welcome uh, Brian Jor Jordan Jefferson for our fourth ellipse of the semester. Um, Brian is an associate professor of geography and geographic information sciences at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. Um, he is the editorial, uh, he's on the editorial board of Urban Geography uh, and a review and open site editor of societyandspace.org. Um, his book, uh, Digitize and Punish, uh, Racial Criminalization in the Digital Age, will be published this spring by the Minnesota University Press. Um, so with that, uh, let's warmly welcome um, Professor Jefferson. Uh, thanks, Wenfei, um, and thanks for all your organizing efforts. Uh, and it's really good to be back here because this project really started here. I was telling them earlier at the Hungarian pastry shop, a lot of it was originally conceived. Um, and the, the project, or this is really the fifth chapter to my book, um, and what it's really looking at is sort of how carceral governance is extending but to the smart city form. Um, and a lot of the things that were going on when I was here were the Lower Manhattan Security in, uh, Initiative, and at the time, it, Bloomberg was you know, talking about having more cameras uh, in New York City um, than London, and it originally was for war and terror efforts, but it sort of mutated uh, into criminal justice. So one of the things I sort of wanted to start with is a movie, uh, to sort of give a visualization, and I think, I hope this works, um, of what I'm looking at. So, here we go. There's no disputing that Shenzhen has become one of the most important places in the world of tech. Nowhere else has quite as potent a combination of tech know-how, cheap manufacturing costs, and sheer speed. But it goes further than that. Living in Shenzhen is in many ways like living in the future. But not necessarily a utopian future. More like the other kind. Try to jaywalk in certain parts of Shenzhen, and the government's facial recognition will spot you. There's even a board of shame showing the faces of recent offenders. Improving lives, increasing connectivity across the world. That's the great promise offered by data-driven technology. But in China, it also promises greater state control and abuse of power. Uh, well, good afternoon, everyone. I guess it is afternoon. Uh, we're here at the Lower Manhattan Security Command Center, our city's state-of-the-art anti-terrorism, counter-terrorism coordination center. And as you know, it is staffed jointly by NYPD officers and security representatives from the private sector. We also use open, open uh, search areas. Uh, there's public databases that are out there that we utilize. Um, we can use Google uh, right up to any type of web page that's necessary, tied in with our internal data. Like analysis we utilize again to see the associations and the connectivity of uh, exactly how these people that uh, are involved in the incident uh, may be associated and this way get closer to solving the crime. So I'm going to give you a demonstration of the NYPD's Domain Awareness System, which is an application that was jointly developed by the police officers at the New York City Police Department and uh, representatives from Microsoft. We will call up all cameras within 500 feet of the 911 call. Those cameras will populate on the screen here. We were analyzing our data. They were saying, yes, you know, the plan to work, the work, the plan. We're on it. And, and so 
appears on a monitor. Sometimes it's captured on camera. A camera that can follow a bad guy trying to get away. The Real Time Crime Center is a chance for the police department to partner with the community to find new ways to keep our city safe. Mm -hmm. Analyze data. Um, we look at historical data and attempt to be able to predict where crimes will occur in the future. Looking for patterns that may cross precinct boundaries and we're monitoring all the cameras. In the new strategic decision support centers, district personnel, as well as crime analysts from the Chicago Police Department and the University of Chicago, are able to monitor developments and gain conflicts in real time. The built-in uh, analytics back ends are right there on the user interface. Makes it nice. I don't have to drag stuff out and open stuff up. I open it all up in milestone. And I utilize, utilize it that way. In lieu of having an officer on every corner, which is impossible for any police department, we're able to use technology as a force multiplier so that we can be in the places that we can't physically be in to see things we couldn't see and know what we couldn't know. And we use all different types of technology together in order to provide a secret community for our residents. It's definitely going to have an impact on the Here's some hangout locations, or here's possible stuff. Then we all got shit. Some of us are still fighting with us at home. Um, being able to adapt the technology to common police practices. It will enhance officer safety. In a terrorist hands, in a real things, right? But government. I think London has half a million cameras and we're just getting started, um, so what I want to uh, I want to open up with that because you know you read a lot of the times it's oh my God China is this authoritarian regime and it has this big sort of surveillance apparatus but it comes from here a lot a social credit system um, which looks at people that are risks comes from Wall Street it was originally a financial uh, instrument um, the Ring of Steel the cameras originally well that's from London in many ways and those feeding and having those cameras thousands of cameras feed into central locations comes from Western democracies they're inventions of Western democracies um, and they've been used in many ways to surveil differentially um, minority populations I had another video about uh, the Uyghurs um, but and another I think really ironic thing is the first video of the guy saying Shenzhen oh my god it's a technological dystopia it was Bloomsburg magazine right but if you go back 12 years it was Bloomberg who originally uh, introduced um, one of these uh, surveillance systems the lower Manhattan security initiative um, so what I'm really looking at um, and this is something that came to me sort of towards the end I wish I, I would have thought about it more earlier um, but the surveillance apparatus comes out of Western democracies um, and I'm going to argue a little bit it comes out and it's fueled by I'll talk a little bit about the IT sector um, at least in the US context um, so the title of the talk, How to Program a Carceral City, is what it's looking at is how cities, how the architecture of the Internet of Things is designed to help identify and capture undesirable people. Um, but in many ways, um, that's a, that's, uh, we have the U.S. to credit for it. Um, so the main thesis of the book is that this is the carceral system. This is the carceral state. Um, the diagram where you have prisons, courts, and police, usually if you study criminology or, or criminal justice, um, is, I think, antiquated or becoming antiquated. And it's better to think about it as a database network. Um, and one of the things that I'm looking at is sort of how the carceral apparatus is morphing or transforming through the database networks. Um, and, the and for my chapter five, the implications for the smart city. Um, so if we think of the smart city, um, we think of how is it changing relations, how is it changing the way people navigate space or don't navigate space. Um, I, I use a lot of Lefebvre, how does it change the way we conceptualize urban space. Um, and then spatial, and then of course spatial practices between people, between the government uh, and citizens. All right. So. Um, the story for, for my research is like a lot of different books on mass incarceration. Ruthie Gilmore probably has the most famous one. Um, uh, William Julius Wilson also did a lot of work on this. Louis Quacant, a bunch of people. Um, uh, but it starts with the industrial city or the breakdown of the industrial city. So um, if we think about mass incarceration in this country, it, we have to think about it in relation to urban political economy, at least to some extent. Um, 
And if you allow me a broad generalization, we know during the high point of industrial urbanization, large parts of cities are essentially factories um, uh, for industrial capital, right? And it brought with it its own transformations in urban space, um, it, whether you talk about pollution or the destruction of the natural environment, um, transformations in social relations, um, urban populations start to expand rapidly, um, and you get a whole host of social and political struggle, whether that's union struggles or whether it's political struggles um, during the high point of, we might say, McCarthyism or something like this. Um, but also technological relations change, or human technological relations start to change. Um, of course, as we get into the high point of industrialization. So one of the things we look at is sort of how people are, of course, becoming sort of expendable vis-a-vis -vis machine factory, uh, factory machines and, and the like. But also when we talk about the industrial city, it's important to think of how capital influenced um, urban policy, which of course influenced social relations, which of course influenced the evolution of urban space itself. So we can think of Pacific Mills, the factories. Um, we can think of General Electric with electrification and the extension of the workday, um, auto factories. Um, but one of the things I was really interested in looking at um, was uh, what would become telecommunications industries. So the computing reporting tabulation company, which is essentially, it be went on to become IBM. Um, of course, sold electrical, electromechanical tabulators to take censuses, which was very important um, in the early 1900s. And it wasn't only important just to keep tabs on the size of the population, but at the time, differentiating white ethnics um, was very important um, because of the nativist politics, of course, and the anti-immigrant uh, sentiments. Um, so one of the things I sort of look at is if we get one of those old tabulation cards, I should have put a picture, one of the tabulation cards, and the way that they differentiate, uh, it was black, then you had about 10 different European nationalities slash ethnicities. Um, there's no Asian, um, typically on these cards, no Latin American either. Um, but it was a very important technology to be able to differentiate and keep tabs on different subgroups. Um, and all of these companies, you can say, or, or you know, interests sort of shaped um, the way that urban space evolved during that time. And then we get deindustrialization. Um, now, deindustrialization, there's a ton of literature on it, of course, in relation to mass incarceration. One way we can think of it, I think a sort of neat and tidy way is through David Harvey's spatial fix, right? So you get capital, and it comes into a city, it finds a workforce, it exploits the workforce, then it finds greener pastures, maybe in rural America, maybe in the suburbs, and then eventually in newly industrializing countries, um, primarily outside of the U.S., and you might think about if the way that space and the organization of populations um, evolves during the industrial period is through the enclosure, right? Because we can th think about Foucault or Deleuze, and they talk about the enclosures. Uh, and one of the ways you deal with a mass of unemployed, um, ethnically and racially undesirable people is through prisons, right? Prisons, um, mirror factories in many ways. Um, but if we look at um, sort of the racial dimension um, of mass incarceration uh, in relation to uh, an economic transformation. We can go to the 1930s, you get the Great Depression, the gray line is unemployment, of course it shoots up um, over 25%. Right? The black line is new prisoners, and you do get a, you do get a, a, little, a modest increase in prison uh, entries during the 30s. But if we go to 1980, and we look at new prisoners, it explodes by 300% over the decade. Um, and in relation to, you can see, so this would essentially be deindustrialization. Prisoners, um, high 70s, in the high 70s, are come from industrial uh, cities. Now, the question might be well, why is there not such a tremendous spike in new prisoners during the uh, Great Depression as compared to during the high point of deindustrialization? Well, we could ask the same question. Why is there not a huge spike in imprisonment in rural America right, right now? Um, because a lot of the unemployment in rural and middle America um, is coming from deindustrialization. Um, 
but their unemployment is not understood as a crime, it's not understood as deviance. Um, you might argue that when we look at uh, rural or white unemployment that comes from deindustrialization, um, people start to become really good sociologists and they start to talk about things about like globalization, um, right? Now when it happens, of course, in the 80s, there's a whole different discourse, right? These people are lazy, they're undeserving, um, they don't deserve welfare, etc. cetera, they're parasitic. Um, and I think you can say the same thing for the 30s, right? So the way that we respond to mass unemployment, um, of course, is different depending on who's unemployed or underemployed, uh, of course. And so, you know, if you are into... Uh, you know, the literature on mass uh, incarceration, there's a general consensus that the prison is one of the mechanisms used to uh, manage mass employment of disproportionately black and Latino, Latinx people. So just to further drive home the point of the social dimensions of carceral governance or mass uh, criminalization, this is taken from the sentencing project um, in 2006. So these data, they're from 2006, but they're still, I think, startling, right? So in 2006, the average man, one in nine, would be incarcerated in this country, which I think is insane. Um, white men, one in 17, which is still, if you look anywhere else in the world, that's pretty insane as well. And black men is one in three, that's unfathomable. Um, Latino men, one in six, unfathomable. Black women, one in 18. More black women are incarcerated in the US than um, any male population anywhere in any developed Western country. Um, you just take black women alone. And they are actually the fastest increasing subgroup um, of, of new uh, prisoners right now. But you can look at Latino women, one in 45 white women, one in 111 all of them, right? So the point is, if, if we go back to sort of deindustrialization, we have to think of, okay, factories, Detroit, Chicago, New York, uh, Philadelphia, they're disproportionately black and Latino. Um, and you, we get, this is sort of one of the ways that the state responded to the problem, right? The shrinking of the welfare state, the expansion of the penal state. Um, and, you know, if, if we go back to the video and think of China, if we sort of try to be aliens and decontextualize ourselves from wherever we're from and just look at the data or look at the trends, um, it's very similar. Um, it perhaps sets a precedent in many ways for thinking about dealing with undesirables. Uh, and it's not new, of course, putting people in camps um, or in storage, but it definitely, uh, the U.S. has contributed to that history. So, these would be the social dimensions of carceral government, of governments, right? Of course, it's um, heavily racialized. Um, now, this was from here, and I might learn that later, probably crunch these data. Um, but this was um, the Million Dollar Block Project. And, this was, and I said earlier, it was really important for the way that I conceptualize thinking about a carceral city. So dark red is prison spending um, per block in New York City. And as you might imagine, the overwhelmingly impoverished black uh, and Latino areas. And then this is sort of the prisoner, um, where prisoners are taken from the city out into rural uh, prisons. And we know there's a recidivist feedback loop of um, going to and from um, the city to rural prisons. And there's a whole lot of literature on the political economy of rural <coughs> prison industries, right? You get uh, communities that are dependent economically on prison development. Um, you get Walmarts, um, hotels, restaurants, right, that become sort of dependent on the presence of prisons, which of course feeds back into policy, um, uh, lobbying policy for harsher criminal justice policies. Now what I wanted to know is, in looking at this and thinking about carceral governance more like a geographer, what is the socio-technical architecture, or maybe I should use that word here loosely, what is the socio-technical sort of substrate um, that is used um, that accompanies this, right? Um, and I got that idea by this quote from Ruthie Gilmore and Craig Gilmore. And they said, the state's management of racial categories is analogous to the management of highways or ports or telecommunication. Uh, racist ideological and material practices are infrastructure that needs to be updated, upgraded, and modernized periodically. My only issue with this quote is they used analogy. And I just took out analogous. Like, well, of course, in some cases it's analogous, but we don't have to think of it as an analogy. 
right? The maintenance of racial categories has physical infrastructure. Um, it needs physical infrastructure, right? Ways of segregating people, ways of supervising them, ways of containing them, right? Ways of surveilling them. It all requires some sort of infrastructure. Um, so I think the question for us now, especially those of us interested in decarcer decarceration um, and decriminalization politics and abolitionist politics is, what, how is carceral, what does smart cities, what does the internet of things, how does that change the geography of carceral governance, right? Um, prison, uh, the a total number of prisons is at a, uh, prisoners is at a 20 year low right now, and that's no guarantee that it won't spike back up, um, but that definitely seems like the trend, partially just because of the, um, the amount of funding that it takes to incarcerate someone, which is about, depending what state you're in, but in Illinois, it's 25K a year. So you could just put the person through college, right? 25K a year exceeds their market uh, value, prisoners for the most part. Um, because if you look at some place like Chicago, um, the average prisoner is, is living on um, around 10,000 a year. So it's more um, uh, expensive to incarcerate them. Uh, and when we get the Great Recession, you get a lot of city administrations going through their budgets and saying, well, wait a second, this is really expensive, right? Can we find alternatives? One of the alternatives in New York State were uh, electronic an ankle bracelets, which of course are much cheaper, um, but I'll get to that. So, um, the, my study is really sort of a, works towards looking at these issues in the, during the smart city era. Um, and when I say smart city, I'm thinking of two things. Mostly the Internet of Things being sort of its infrastructural logic, um, the Internet of Things being digital devices communicating with one another behind the scenes, um, modifying processes, whether it's um, uh, energy provision or water provision right, um, behind the scenes. And, that's, and of course, it's used for everything from traffic to energy um, to home security and health care. Um, one of the things trains, um, their schedules when they come can be automatically modified to account for um, changes in traffic that are observed by uh, sensors on the street. So this type of stuff. And the question is sort of, well, if we know that traffic has been adapted to IoT, if we know that um, um, retail, of course, pretty much any major dimension of urban living um, has been adapted to IoT, so has criminal justice provision, right? Um, and it's cheaper and in many ways more invasive than mass incarceration. And that's not to downplay mass incarceration because there are still um, about two million people incarcerated, and that's, that's not my intent. But one way is to think of the infrastructural logic. So in other words, if we think of the industrial city as the factory, right, and if we think of the prison as essentially that type of factory, that uh, enclosure that's so common to the factory system and the, fact, and the way of thinking about organizing space into neat um, chunks of, of space that are tightly regulated, um, then we can think of the internet, uh, the smart city uh, through the internet of things, at least to some extent, through networks, uh, infrastructure networks, where traffic is talking to energy provision, is talking to security systems, all behind the scenes. So that's one of the sort of major things that I'm, I'm trying to think about um, as, as sort of a logic that is uh, changing carceral governance. The second um, is information capital, which I take from Manuel Castells, his network uh, society. But as, as an urban geographer, so much of the work that looks at the way that cities started to change in the 80s and the 90s focus, understandably, on finance. Of course, Harvey focuses on the finance, what does he call the financial coup um, in, in the city in the 80s. Um, and a lot of the great, other great work focuses on real estate capital. Sometimes it is finance real estate capital. But especially the work on gentrification is looking at the increased uh, value of properties um, and the ways that financial interests and real estate interests work in conjunction with city governments to try to find ways to kick out people who can't afford um, to live in, in a redeveloping city. Um, but I think one thing that's sort of a, a fraction of capital, if you will, that is not studied that much information capital. Um, and some of it, okay, it could be telecommunications or it could be software. And but I sort of put them under the umbrella of information capital. IBM, Motorola, Oracle, 
right? Um, I, I would argue that they have as much uh, influence over um, urban administration as Pacific Mills or Ford factories would have had a um, hundred years, well, not, maybe not a hundred years. Yeah, well, a hundred years ago. Wait, I forget what year it is. Yeah, a hundred years ago. Um, and they influence not only um, policy, but they also influence social relations. Of course, we're dependent more and more on these technologies to live our social life. Um, and they're also shaping spatial relations, the way that um, urban space is used, the way that it's transforming in many cases. Um, so these are sort of the two things that I'm looking at. How has car sale governance sort of adapted or mutated to the smart city through the Internet of Things um, and through uh, IT interests? So that's, that's the question, right? What happens when carceral government governance meets information capital? Um, and, and pretty much all of the stuff on mass incarceration focuses on industrial capital, and they focus on the spatial fix. They focus on um, factories leaving New York, leaving Philadelphia, leaving Detroit, leaving Chicago, um, and sort of the vacuum that it leaves and the, the destitution that it leaves. Um, and that's part of Harvey's spatial fix. Capital leaves, it finds greener pastures. But there's another part I think that's a little bit neglected, is that new fractions move in. And again, we've talked about finance and real estate, but also IT. So, um, I, my, the book looks at both New York City and Chicago, but figured I'd do New York City. Um, the sort of story of um, the sort of smart carceral city uh, begins, it it's really begins post 9-11. Um, and in 2005, the Lower Manhattan Security Initiative, um, the plans are first drawn up for the LMSI. And this initiative was essentially, we're going to put 3,000 cameras um, primarily around tourist areas and areas of financial um, importance. Right? And the idea is, you know, a lot of stuff is on facial recognition. Now, a lot the cameras didn't necessarily have facial recognition, but they had different technologies. Some would be able to um, identify objects such as a backpack that's left unintended. Um, there's also recognition software of your gates, of how you walk, which comes from Israel, right? Because uh, the idea is you can spot a terrorist by how they walk. Um, uh, there are also um, environmental sensors, radiation sensors, audio sensors, um, etc. cetera. And the, and the basic idea, is if an anomaly or something, is, or something suspicious is detected by a camera, it would automatically alert a command center, but then it also automatically alerts the nearest patrol unit um, that's available um, to intercept or to um, um, observe what's going on. Um, so it, it's this game of sort of being able to almost warping urban space, being able to capture, identify or capture undesirable, anom anomalous or suspicious behavior um, at a faster and faster clip. And that's sort of the basic uh, uh, idea of the security initiative. Um, of course, it draws on London's ring of steel. Uh, one of the things that um, Bloomberg was intent on was beating, of course, the British and having more cameras. Um, and after the LMSI was uh, announced, I think two years later, there's the Midtown Manhattan Security Initiative, which was just an extension of the original one. And then we're getting up to 10,000 cameras, according to reports. But the, these are, I don't know how um, those data are sort of, it's difficult. No one knows how, how many cameras um, are in any of these major cities. Um, but it also had different... Um, Sensors. One would be license plate readers um, on patrol vehicles, but also um, mounted uh, throughout the urban environment. And again, um, the, every bridge and tunnel that led into Manhattan was fitted with a security camera. So it created sort of what I like to think of, of almost like a moat, um, a 21st century moat of knowing, being, or at least being able to detect who's coming in, who's coming out. Um, the last article I read was 2016, and there were um, uh, 17 billion scans or something in the database. Um, but it wasn't only license plate readers, there were also um, audio sensors. Some were gunshot um, detections, but others were looking for upticks of, of noise, of crowd noise from people. Um, there were also environmental sensors, radiation sensors, uh, and these types of things. And again, the idea was to have this network. 
of, of machines that, like one of the guys in the video said, um, would be the eyes and ears, uh, where, you know, to multiply the eyes and ears of the police. Um, and again, it starts off as a war on terror initiative. It's related to counterterrorism, um, but it morphs into uh, the NYPD's um, everyday policing of crime around 2012. So the domain awareness uh, system is a piece of software created, um, co-created by the NYPD and IBM. And one of the central app applications is called the Prime Warehouse. Um, and the idea here is that um, people who have criminal records become undesirable, suspicious objects um, just in their mere presence. Um, and this is where the facial recognition of struggle becomes important, um, right? Because if the technology works, which usually it actually doesn't, um, but it will eventually someday, right? And you have to think of this picture of um, the, the images we saw in China, but they would be here too. Facial scans, being able um, to instantly identify people with criminal records, um, and you can just imagine the implications of that. But domain awareness sort of signifies the transformation of these, um, what they're called data fusion centers, the LMSI, um, from national security to everyday criminal justice. Uh, and that, I think, is the important thing. And you, you have to think of it in relation to networks of cameras, networks of sensors, um, networks of patrol um, um, cars as well. Um, all being fed into centralized locations and machines having the ability to alert um, without human intervention, but also humans, of course, using it to uh, intervene without computers. But the point is that I believe that there's an externalization of the carceral system. So if the carceral system is, is predominantly in these three branches, prisons, police, courts, the arg my argument is it's pervading, it's spreading through the actual urban architecture the material space, right? And at the core of it is this sort of power fantasy, and I don't think that it's ever this efficient, um, and that's always something that I think it's important to watch out for, to say this is some totalizing, um, completely efficient um, machine, because it's not. There are, of course, still inefficiencies. Um, people um, don't always use the information. Um, there are misfires, there are malfunctions, etc. But the point is just thinking about the tendency and the horizon um, that this marriage between IoT and carceral governance um, portends. Um, so what I see is an externalization of the carceral state. And, and just to look at a couple um, initiatives to come out of the Domain Awareness Center, one was the Mobility Initiative. Um, and OK, this was originally giving NYPD officers um, mobile phones with their own specialized suite of applications. Uh, it was, they're originally Nokia phones, um, and one of the women that were in the video, Tish, she's a director of the Information Technology Bureau for the NYPD. Um, well, she got in hot water uh, a while ago because they bought like $30 million worth of these phones, but then the operating system was defunct and they weren't updating it, so they had to throw them all out. And then they got apps. Um, but the important thing is, and that's where tax money is going, that's another thing that I think is important about thinking about IT. Um, and one of the things I found in my project, which I did not think of going into, are the billions and billions of dollars of tax monies that have gone into prototyping um, these technologies. Um, I also probably should have said the domain awareness um, system is a proprietary technology and it's sold all across uh, the U.S. but even outside of the U.S. and New York City I think it's 30 percent of the profits and I can get 70 percent, the other 70 percent, right? Um, but what I, you know, we have to think of in terms of criminal justice and technology, a lot of it what I found is, is prototyped by taxpayers' money. Um, in 2015, um, the Department of Homeland Security opened up its Silicon Valley office uh, which essentially funds startups, uh, which tells them what they need, and, 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 and the startups uh, develop it. So that's something. But in any event, the mobility initiative, of course, was, it was a suite of apps um, for patrol officers. And of course, you could do things like search run names, license plates, etc., cetera, um, and they can draw on databases, um, whether they're in upstate New York, uh, the National um, Crime Information Center in, in West Virginia, um, other fusion centers across the country, they have instant sort of access 
um, and that's one thing. But another thing that I'm interested in are forms. And now officers prepare and transmit um, incident reports on the street. And it's not, it's not a radical transformation, but what I think it's doing is it's externalizing criminal processing onto the street. Right? And again, I'm thinking of trends or tendencies. Um, so none of these things, uh, I think, taken in isolation is you know, that radical of a transformation. But the bigger picture is that criminal booking is now done on the street. It turns the police officer, in many ways, into um, a data processor, which is ironic because in China, that's what police do. They're not, they don't, they're not agents of violence. Um, they more so are taking data. They're in, in putting, uh, recording data. Uh, and that's what they're doing in the U.S., but they have guns. Right, uh, as well. So that would be one, the mobility initiative. Another would be um, electronic bracelets, e-carceration sometimes it's called. Um, and this would be mostly for people on parole and probation. Um, and in 2000, oh, I want to say seven or eight, it was right around the recession, um, upstate New York starts their ATI, their alternative to incarceration. Um, and they start using um, ankle bracelets. And then in 2015, there was a, a big expose in the Times about juveniles in Rikers prison. And I think, well, this was, I think it was good. They were taken out of the prisons, but they were getting ankle bracelets. Um, but the ankle bracelets are, you know, on one hand, movements are traced, movements are predicted. But another interesting thing about ankle bracelets is they have what are called geofences. I'm sh sure uh, you guys are somewhat familiar with it. But a geofence is, is essentially if you step across this longitude or latitude, um, an alert will be sent to the nearest available patrol officer. So again, what you're seeing is sort of this external externalization of being able to um, monitor and manage people's mobilities. Um, and again, it's not as horrific as being in a prison, um, but still you can sort of see a different horizon of carceral management um, coming into focus. Uh, Another technology you might think of is CompStat, uh, the CompStat 2.0. Um, and 2.0 is when the NYPD put their crime database online. Um, now, an interesting thing is you get a couple developments out of this. One is network surveillance. Um, once everyday citizens were able to enter data into the uh, database or, or complaints via the website, um, I argue that civilians started becoming sentinels, right, of policing, of, of surveillance in some ways. Um, another thing is, of course, looking at the data of people use these maps, as we know, to determine where they want to live, uh, where they want to travel, where they want to eat, and things like this increasingly. Um, so in many ways, I think these online databases, they sort of influence people to see like a police state. You know, so if you know seeing like a state, um, I forget the word that, the old piece in my, in my policy days. But this is seeing like a police state, right? It's looking at um, people and some who have done, of course, vicious crimes, but others who are drug um, criminals, um, which is not that vicious, and it's keeping constant track of where they are, where they're concentrated. Um, and it, uh, I think it, it makes us think of the city as, you know, this place of even more partitioning uh, where we want to go, where it's desirable, where it's undesirable. Um, and it enjoins this, the average civilian to participate, uh, I think, in that visualization. Um, so one of the things that happens is the NYPD starts generating so much data so much video footage, and that's one of the most important things, are, um, which, you know, they're very heavy data payloads, video, um, and they ran out of storage. So they signed a 25-year lease, and they, ha they um, occupied three floors in the Verizon Center um, and, and used their, um, their data storage. Uh, so again, you see this um, collaboration between telecommunications, I would call it IT, um, and the city, right? Um, and you can imagine, I don't know offhand, uh, but how much that lease probably cost. It's over 20 years. So uh, there are three theses that come out of, out of the work. First, that database networks are extending the war on crime and drugs. Right? And of course, I'm sure we're all familiar with, you know, there's the one argument that we know, of course, this is just another iteration of using science or scientific discourse um, to normalize or to justify um, state violence, state exclusion, 
on differential administration of people, which is an old story. There's nothing new about that. Um, but that's one. That's part of the uh, picture, right? Now we don't even think about. Um, well, should we really be using um, um, police force uh, and monitoring and surveillance and the criminal justice system as the main mechanism to deal with urban poverty and urban mar marginalization and unemployment and underemployment? That you know. Well, if a machine says, oh, well, there's the bad guy, then it sort of um, skirts that debate in many ways. Um, and, you know, one of the things that I found in the process of writing the book was this is, in many ways, more a liberal invention. Um, that goes back to Lyndon Johnson, who was uh, LEA, Law Enforcement Administration Agency, I think, um, a technocratic solution. Um, it's a sanitized way of doing something that often I think many liberals would jump on Reagan for doing, right? Mass criminalization and mass, mass incarceration. Um, if you look at after Ferguson, well, not, um, there's a famous pamphlet, it's an Obama uh, task force uh, that looks at, uh, it's called Policing in the 21st Century, and essentially what it's saying is, well, we have to go, we have to look to the IT sector to help us um, deal with racial policing. Um, and for instance, the cameras were one of the big solutions. And if you know the politics of the cameras, um, some of them, it turned out, um, they, were fee they were using them not only for police-civilian interactions, but also for surveillance. Um, and Taser International, which makes the cameras that the NYPD uses, um, their, um, within less than a fiscal year, their profits went up by 75% after um, Ferguson. Um, and maybe it is better, but I think um, to have the cameras, but I think it's important to think about the underlying relations um, but, and also the underlying legacy of the war on crime and drugs. Second, IT sector is fueling this extension. I think it's pretty they, commonsensical if they want to sell cameras or software. And they want to sell more. Uh, that's just the way that businesses work. Um, so they'll never be lacking in a reason for a new technology to use uh, to surveil or to manage crime. Uh, third, this IT carceral nexus is transforming geographies of carceral power, um, and that's what I mean by an externalization um, of the carceral state. And then lastly, uh, these developments pose new challenges um, and opportunities for abolitionist politics. And, you know, another thing, and I'm a, you know, I'm a, a, a child of Foucault in many ways, right, so I always have to resist this urge of, of this sort of um, totalizing autonomous power that's unstoppable. It's not unstoppable, um, but it does pose new challenges, and it also poses new opportunities um, in, in many ways to use the data against the state. So if, if I have like a, a, a database of the Chicago police and it's, it says that I think it was like 89% of all people arrested for vandal, um, vandalism, um, it was something in the 90s people for 90 percentile of people for gambling. 75% um, of people for drug crimes are all black or Latino. You don't really need to make an argument. They've already made it for you. Um, it's not like black and Latino people came together and said, let's commit more crimes at some point. Right? It's a function of the policy. Um, and so I do think new opportunities for abolitionist politics are opening up through this sort of excessive um, documentation and reliance on um, uh, technology. But to uh, get that, you'll have to buy the book in next spring. Thank you. Um, so we have about 15 or 20 minutes for questions. I'll just let you. Oh, thanks. Yeah. Oh, yeah. With an abolitionist lens. So how can um, the types of community groups, nonprofits, places where many masters and 
Yeah, well, I think they are. Um, so in Chicago, there's the Mijente movement and to destroy the gang database. Um, San Francisco, of course, was the first um, city to abolish um, the facial recognition cameras. Um, and then shortly after that, a city in Massachusetts, I forget its name, did. Um, I think that was the question sort of how can, how can we sort of intervene? One way is, I think, how we think about data. So, like, if the police say 90% of people who commit crime are black, like, I have a, um, a quote from 1912 where the police commissioner said 60% um, of people who commit crimes are Jewish, right? So, I mean, I think there, there are precedents for people um, critiquing the use of science and data science. And, again, I, I think that's, like, the least... Um, interesting part of, of my research, right? The review of science from phrenology um, to statistical social science um, in the 1890s. So if anyone's really read um, 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 Muhammad, uh, Jabril, Jabril Muhammad, I forget it, Jabril Muhammad's book called The Condemnation of Blackness. He looks at the history of how social science and social statistics were used in the late 1800s and early 1900s. Um, so I just think it's another chapter in the story of, of how science used to um, to justify these types of policies. And I think if people want to get interested, they're looking at the history. Because when I first started out with the project, I would say, oh, this is this new thing, everything's new. And then I started all the way in, in 1890 with the census tabulator machine, which of course became IBM. And it was the same story a lot, different target, different context. Um, but I, I would think not being so president, president not thinking in the present, but thinking about how these things have been done throughout history and looking at how people in the past have uh, dealt with it. It's a good way to look at it. But I don't think it will come from the academy, though, to be honest. Yeah, following up on that, I had a question about um, racialization in abolition strategy. Mm -hmm. A concern that I feel in the way that some of the critiques that I'm seeing coming up of smart cities and the shifting politics of the carceral state is that using languages of disparity and inequity mm -hmm. by focusing on the disproportionate ways that the effects of surveillance and uh, criminalization fall on targeted populations, specifically black and, and Latinx populations, that that may have this unintended effect of naturalizing the overall surveillance process and making it seem like the only thing that's wrong with it is that it's disparate in its application. Mm. So can you suggest any you know, rhetorical strategies or ways of approaching it politically that acknowledge white supremacy and colonialism in the ways that specific populations are targeted, but also focus on the underlying surveillance mm -hmm. architecture? Oh, yeah. To yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, I think it's inherent in the word abolition. Um, it, it's abolishing the system of governance, um, which does in general, and it, it's, of course it's connected to broader politics of surveillance, but I guess I would come from the other direction and say one of the issues is when we talk about surveillance um, as, if it's un, as if it's evenly spread um, oftentimes, and, and, you see, and I do see that a lot in especially media studies, um, which doesn't really have, um, it doesn't, well I use racial capitalism, um, and most of the stuff on race that I've read, and you know, I'm not in media studies, but it's more about how people express themselves, um, or how they're mixed recognized by an algorithm. Um, but for me, I think the danger is thinking of this as an evenly spread out um, process. Um, and I think the way that smart cities or, or big data companies sort of, um, people's relations to them are different. So if you're middle class, it might be stealing our private data, which is a huge problem. Um, but it might not be cameras in our actual living spaces. One of the things that I should have put in that I left out are public housing. Um, the domain awareness uh, center system was extended through public housing. Um, so I, I, I think it's a great point that we have to think of this as, as a system of governance that needs to be critiqued in its entirety. But I also think it's important to not make uh, false equivalences between the ways that some of the most marginalized people, um, their relation to technology, which is probably much different than our relation to technology in, in this room. But, uh, Thank you so much. Um, I have long wondered why the left 
not bothered by surveillance and um, sometimes feel like hysteric when I see my leftist friends or abolitionist peers willingly using facial recognition on their phones, oh. for example. And it feels to me sometimes um, just hopelessly ubiquitous and like we're kind of all giving our lives over. Um, and then there's a more optimistic part of me that feels that maybe people just don't understand like the change to our urban landscape, as you're saying. So I'm just wondering um, what you think about galvanizing the left and like kind of making this an issue that people are really motivated to do something. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's sort of galvanizing itself. Um, you're seeing like um, the Electronic Frontier Foundation um, is big and I think there's a lot of anti-facial recognition politics that is sort of um, popping up on both coasts. Um, there's uh, people are getting, you know, the ankle bracelet stuff. I, I think it is sort of um, popping up throughout um, leftist uh, politics. Um, using it in our personal lives has a different story. But I do think it is, it, and again, I try to think like both ways or directly about it. Of course, it's, you know, new forms of power uh, and surveillance are, are um, evolving, but also new opportunities are evolving for networking, for networking activist groups, right? Um, so I think it's important to not have a one-sided story, te be techno-pessimist and say, oh, it's bad, it's this big to totalitarian thing, um, which it kind of is. But it also has new opportunities, I think, for organizing. And I do think that people, um, just looking at news clips, are starting to, um, to really uh, catch on to it. The thing, though, I think is it's so late, that we catch on to it so late. Like, in, in the book I show, a lot of the stuff is originally um, proposed in the 80s and trickled out in the 90s. Um, and even if you look at something like Facebook, it took us like 20 years to figure out what their business model was. Um, so I think like more people are becoming interested in the issue and they're doing digging and, and they're starting finding, oh wait, this is a problem bigger than we thought of. But I think, it, I think slowly it's happening. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I don't. I maybe don't have anything more sophisticated than saying they want to sell software and hardware. The IT industry, for me, one of the more the interesting things about the political economy is um, how the state it not only co-designs, it also funds the development of a lot of these technologies um, as well. Um, but I mean, I think it's it's pretty uncontroversial to say that IBM, if they could sell one package of domain awareness, they'd want to sell two or three. And I just think it's 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 an old story of um, you don't want to mix economic incentive and incarceration. Uh, a good person to, to look at this is W. E. B. Du Bois noticed this after slavery. Um, and he noticed this within the um, convict lease system, which was a system where you would have prisoners and they'd be leased out to industrial, uh, railroads, mining companies. Um, and what do you see? You see this rapid explosion of black prisoners. So I think the real story is you don't want to mix economic incentive and, and incarceration or punishment. It's, like, it's one of the most dangerous combinations you can have. Um, and that, I guess, was one I saw as maybe a task of the book was just to expose that link. And uh, I think a lot of people could do much more um, better empirical work on it than I did. Um, there was, um, I remember one person, she was asking, uh, well, how much, you know, can you sort of quantify the profits? And I don't even know how to start to try to do that. Um, but, yeah, I, I, I try to expose the link and then hopefully it can be developed. Yeah. Oh, sorry. You mentioned uh, potentially a tie between incarceration and gender family neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. Are you aware of research that directly makes that link with sort of the causal yeah. way that looks at people sort of being put out of these rural prisons? You showed that graphic, and then yeah. those neighborhoods subsequently changing. I would start with Neil Smith. Um, his book, with The Gentrification Frontier, is or his stuff on the revanchist city. Um, there's Louis Wakant. Uh, who's a bit of a lightning rod, but 
he does work on that stuff too uh, in Chicago. Um, who else? Uh, gentrification. David Wilson is in my department. Uh, he wrote a book called uh, Black on Black, Inventing Black on Black Violence. Um, but yeah, I would start. I would start with this. But yeah, there there is um, a lot of that stuff. Uh, it was funny. So one of the things I did for the book when I was doing research here was um, talking to grassroots groups, um, and they were saying this was like 2005, uh, 2006. They already saw the way that policing was transforming in ways to abet gentrifiers. Um, so I think they've been onto it uh, for for decades. Oh, sorry, yeah. Do you think you buy the, the cameras at all locations and the, uh, the facial recognition is kind of a traditional technology in which we're going to actually have biochips in our bodies and other bodies? Yep. Every time you walk through an intersection, you're going to be automatically identified, right? It would not surprise me, but hopefully I won't be alive by then. Um, <laughs> but I mean, you already see it in Amazon, uh, warehouses are using it um, for employees. Um, uh, and to, to track employees' movements and their productivity. Um, it wouldn't surprise me um, in, in the far, well, who knows how fast the technology develops. But I do think that's the importance of, of sort of, um, you know, back to the earlier question about how do we galvanize it. It's not that, again, I'm not like a techno-pessimist, but it's how are we using this technology. And, and I think you do see a lot of people who are, and especially younger people who are saying, becoming more critical of this and, and more um, aware of it. So hopefully they could stem off that future. But the way things are going now, I, I don't see why not. Because in China, the, uh, the Uyghurs are kept in a re-education camp, mm -hmm. so to speak. Is that considered to be full incarceration? Or is oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, but I mean, one of my arguments is, is we might have inspired that system. Um, the U.S., um, and again, it's an ethnic, it's a, it's an undesirable ethnic minority, um, put in essentially a, a camp. Which okay, that's not new. Um, but also some of the facial recognition things, of, you know, when they're walking around in just an open street, like they'll be identified. And these things can be sent to authorities. They can be sent to stores for purchasing things, um, um, and and all the rest of it. Um, but I don't think, I think the, the idea that it's that radically different in, in China than it is in the U.S. is overwrought um, and perhaps Orientalist. Uh, I don't think it's as, as radically different as, as, as like the, the media likes to, uh, likes to show. I mean, they got the technology. The social um, credit score that they use, again, you know, that's, a, that's a Wall Street invention. Um, the only thing, they centralize it, but we disseminate the technology through the private market. I don't know what's worse. History shows it could be worse if it's disseminated through the market. It could be more unstoppable um, if it's, it's, it's corporations rather than a central governmental bureaucracy saying we're using this power. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So how are the mechanisms, are they implicated in a value in a way that the institutions are produced? Yeah. Well, yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, for the first um, part in warping space, I, I mean mostly, I'm mostly just talking about patrol uh, cars um, and, and response time. 
um, and making it, you know, the, I think the fantasy is having instant um, response to anything undesirable or seeming out of place or, um, uh, or anomalous. Um, and in that sense, what the cameras do is they cut down on response time. Um, and that has a history that goes back um, to the 40s with they're called um, uh, CAD, Computer Aided Dispatch. Uh, and it was displacing human operators for dispatch calls um, using sort of really well primitive uh, uh, computing technology. Um, but now we use it through the IoT and the idea is just, if you could, if this, trend continues uninterrupted. You can imagine a future where people have biochips and uh, they do anything wrong jaywalking and you can sort of have this instantaneous um, authority pop up, almost materialize out of space. Um, but the second question, that's a tough one. I think it's a really um, good question. I think one... So having people sort of see like a police state and be um, sort of surveillance sentinels for the police. Um, it's usually rolled out in the language of community policing and data democratization and these types of things. And, and, and this happened before big data. Um, and I noticed it when I did research here with community groups um, in Bed-Stuy who, they were civilian anti-crime activists. And you know, I went in there uh, and by the end of my research I was like, oh, they're just functionaries of the, of the police. Right now, they had real problems they were dealing with. They, there was, of course, violence and crime, um, but in many ways, the police were trying to mobilize them to expand their surveillance capabilities. Um, so I think it does. It's it's more. It contributes to the ubiquitousness of of, of the police uh, and of police surveillance, um, and it's cheaper. And you know, you could fit this into some neoliberal story of devolving um, administrative duties from the state to the communities or the private sector. So I think all of those things are at play.